we also talked about how like I don't know what like how you can filter the stuff and whatnot, but each state has its own um, like education requirements because the federal government doesn't have like an overall arching standard for every state. And so we could just talk about how like if I wanted to search for certain things in Kansas, I could be like hearing from my curriculum or like there's things that I could be leaving out. Like it could just be difficult to find exactly what you're looking for. So, What, what, one of the things, presuming that it's all online and nothing's in print, that every student has equal access to electronic resources, did you and, and uh, uh, if, in case there's any homework or other things that you know, have to find a way to work around that? and concerns. It does increase the discoverability of OERs in a familiar interface. Uh, it makes it easy to choose something because there are reviews. Uh, it could help OER become a little bit more mainstream, as I mentioned earlier, and possibly it could lead to a similar platform in higher ed. On the other hand, uh, because it's Amazon, you have to log in to download resources, which could be a privacy concern if you know students start using it at the K-12 level or their parents start using it. Um, it could put other OER directories out of commission. There are some other OER directories. I'll talk about them a little bit, but not a great deal. Um, there's no provision for materials in the public domain. Uh, so materials that uh, were published a long time ago, where the copyright has expired, or materials that were published by the US government actually are in the public domain by default. Uh, or orphan works, you might be wondering what an orphan work is. Uh, it is a term for work where we don't know who the copyright belongs to. Maybe the original person who wrote it has died and the copyright has passed on to their heir but not expired yet, but you can't figure out who their heir is and you're looking around and you're like, who owns this work? And you have no idea. So there's no provision for that. Uh, and possibly they could also use the platform to advertise paid content, which sort of defeats the point of having an OER platform. So we don't necessarily trust Amazon. We might trust Amazon, I don't know. Uh, the Achieving the Dream Initiative, we already talked a little bit about it. Uh, I think it's important, even though it's not at the four-year college level, uh, because it does demonstrate increasing the support for OER initiatives, and it will result in the creation of new OERs, hopefully, that could also be used in lower division courses at four-year colleges, like here, if we want those to be funded. Uh, I mentioned the Affordable College Textbook Act. Uh, it was reintroduced in October after a failed attempt in 2013. It would provide uh, pilot funding for OER programs in higher ed. Uh, and it was referred to a committee and we haven't heard from it since, but perhaps we will, who knows. Uh, also this year, as I said, the US Department of Education hired a dedicated open education advisor who theoretically will provide support for both K-12 and higher ed uh, and will work with tool providers and developers, district and state leaders and educators, but not directly with students, so probably not with you guys. But it's nice that they have one, that they seem to be caring. So, we have talked about why you should care about OERs, because they're sort of gaining momentum in the mainstream, and you might want to know what they are, so you can be intelligent and tell all your peers about OERs. Maybe not, that's not a thing that we talk about. Uh, they can also save you a lot of money as a student. Uh, here is a graph of the increase in textbook price 
prices uh, versus the increase in the consumer price index, which is inflation in general. Uh, since 1980, you will notice that the price of textbooks is going up really fast. It's going up much faster than the consumer price index in general. Uh, here are some estimates of what students should be spending on textbooks. Uh, the College Board estimate estimates that if you buy all of the course materials that you're supposed to be buying, uh, and you buy them new, uh, that you'll be spending between 1200 and 1249 and 1364 a year on textbooks. Is that year or semester? That's per year. Uh, Every, every university is also required to estimate uh, how much their students will be paying for course materials. FHSU's estimate, estimate is $840, which is significantly lower than the College Board's estimate. Hopefully none of you are paying more than $1,200 a year for, for textbooks. On average, students actually don't pay that much for textbooks. Uh, according to the National Association of College Stores, on average students actually spend about $646 a year on textbooks, which you might notice is about half of what you're supposed to be spending if you're an average student. Why is that? Well, it's because students don't always buy the required textbook. You all may have foregone buying some textbooks, or you might have bought a used textbook, you might have rented a textbook, you might have borrowed a textbook from your friends, or done some other thing that involves not buying the, 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 all of the textbooks that you're supposed to buy at their new price. Has everybody done that? <laughs> Just out of curiosity, does anybody have an estimate of how much they spent on, on textbooks last year, or this semester? Maybe? Goodness, that's expensive. Was that just this semester, or was that last year? This semester, I spent around 530 and I rented it. And you rented it? Oh my goodness, that's quite a bit. Who else? Anybody else have an estimate? but I have like, I take art classes as well, so I actually like my lab fees and stuff, which is like in the casing of a textbook, so like things like that will add up on top of that. So you might appreciate that <laughs> if we had entirely OER degrees here at FHSU, which currently we do not, although some of the departments are very good about using, uh, using OERs, like I know nursing and education use a lot of OERs, some of the other departments are working on it. I know the business department is working on it because I've gotten several requests from professors in the College of Business and Entrepreneurship for me to search for OERs for them, which is something that I do. I take search requests. I tell your professors, I take search requests. Uh, but you might appreciate that if we had entirely OER degree initiatives, you could be spending zero dollars on this course material. or you haven't gotten access to the textbook in some other way, there are some detrimental effects of that. Uh, you may or may not have experienced these. Hopefully you have not. Uh, these are some numbers from a survey that was conducted in 2012 uh, by uh, a set of community colleges in Florida. They surveyed their students on um, what their students do when the textbooks are too expensive and they can't afford them. Um, a lot of them don't purchase the required textbook. Some of you have said that you don't do that. You rent it instead. Maybe some of you just forgo the textbook entirely. You don't know. Uh, you could take fewer courses. It's a good way of reducing the cost of textbooks. Uh, you could not register for a specific course that has a very expensive textbook. You maybe know ahead of time that the textbook is going to be expensive. Uh, you could earn a bad grade because you didn't get that textbook, and so you don't have access to the assignments. Uh, you could end up dropping a course because you're just doing really badly, or in fact, you could end up failing a course. It's very bad not to have textbooks or, or course materials. Not everything is a textbook. So, two reasons that you should care about OERs. First, 
They're gaining momentum in the mainstream. Second, they can save you as a student money. Thirdly, you can actually do better in your classes with OERs. I'm going to talk about a couple of studies. Uh, this first one that I'm going to talk about uh, was published in 2015. It was a meta-study of 13 peer-reviewed studies of OER, the effects of using OERs versus traditional textbooks in the same courses. It included about 120,000 students in total. And in the study, this meta-study of other smaller studies that compared OERs and traditional commercially published textbooks, about 95% of the students experienced the same or better outcomes. So the students did just as well. Another study in 2014, uh, this was also a meta-study that compared 12 peer-reviewed studies of perceptions of OER quality. So they talked to about 1,500 students, or uh, yes, about 2,500 students, that's supposed to say, and 2,500 faculty. Uh, and they asked them, what do you think of the OERs that you've been using in your classes? Are they high quality? Uh, and 85% of those students and those professors said, yeah, the OERs are about the same quality or better quality. Caveat, this is not true for every single subject. As somebody who searches for OERs as part of my living, I can tell you for some subjects there are lots of OERs, like say algebra, lots of open algebra textbooks, or beginning Spanish, there are several of those. Some subjects are a little bit more obscure, obscure. environmental science, for instance, a little bit harder to find textbooks on that. Uh, if you go into advanced language studies, like advanced Spanish, it's very difficult to find those. So it really does depend a little bit. However, uh, for core courses that get taught in the first couple of years, like uh, lower division courses, there are usually a lot of OERs available for those. Whether instructors use them or not, it's up to them, but they are available. So, <coughs> here's some, some citations of, of the data that I have just given you. You might or might not care. So, I have given you three reasons now, I think, that you should care about OERs. But, we have another half an hour, I believe. Some hands on things. If you have a laptop, follow along. If you don't have a laptop, follow along. <laughs> but not on your laptop. So, you can. Use OERs in your classes, even if they are not assigned by your instructors. Specifically, this is the library homepage, by the way. No, it isn't. Where's the library homepage? page? <laughs> yeah, one moment. No, that's not what I just did. This is the library homepage. The other was a screensaver or a background. Uh, so, fhsu.edu slash library is the library homepage. On the library homepage, uh, in this first box, there is a link that says Open Educational Resources that you may or may not have noticed before. Actually, it's new. We installed it this summer. I think there was a link before that, but it went to a different place. No, where where is that. it? Mm -hmm. uh, it was on the homepage in the first white box in the middle. Resources. Uh, there's some information here, an overview of what OERs are and why we care here at FHSU. I'm sure we, we do care here at FHSU. We have a committee for OERs. I am on the committee, somewhere here near the bottom, yes. Uh, we are actually looking for student representatives for that committee. So if you're part of the Student Government Association, 
or you know somebody, please encourage them to come be in the student representative on the OER committee. We are actively, actively searching for one right now, right this second. Not right this second, I'm actually in the middle of doing your presentation. But recently we have asked them uh, to, to send us uh, a student representative. So it would have to be someone from student government, it couldn't just be some random student. You know, I'm not quite sure what the rules are on that. I just, uh, I'm in a committee for the library as a senator. Yeah, there's a library committee board. separate from the OER committee. Okay. We appreciate that, though. <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was the same. No, it's, it's different. We do different things. We are also library related. program that we just started last spring. The library received some funding from a donor who was interested in funding the creation of open educational resources here at FHSU. Uh, and in fact, we have funded free faculty to create or adapt open textbooks. So that's sort of exciting. We're hoping to do another round of funding this semester. But the part of this that you'll probably be most interested in is the finding of OERs. Go ahead and click on that. There's some contact information here for me. I am the OER <coughs> expert. So if you ever have any questions, you should come talk to me. Uh, and I have a research guide for searching for open educational resources. Uh, it has a lot of tabs that are primarily for instructors uh, on finding, say, textbooks and books. Remember, I talked about those repositories of OERs later that Amazon and Spire might be putting out of business. There are actually quite a lot of them. I have a whole list of them. But what you will probably be interested in, in terms of finding Creative Commons licensed works that count as OERs, is this media tab. Who has ever had to do a presentation for class? What? Oh, you have. Okay, good going to say. Uh, and, and who has ever needed pictures or videos or sound clips for those presentations? All of you. Excellent. That is as it should be. So uh, I know that sometimes you will just go on Google Images and search for some images and you can do that but some of those images might be copyrighted. You might be breaking copyright law by putting them in your presentations. Probably you won't get sued for it. But it's better not to do that, and especially because there are so many different uh, Creative Commons licensed resources available for that purpose. I'm going to go ahead and start here with something called Creative Commons Search. It's very nice. It searches a variety of different platforms uh, for works that are uh, in the public domain or Creative Commons licensed. Can somebody give me something to search for? Free. All right. So, if we wanted to sell our picture of the tree, uh, we might want to check this use for commercial purposes box. Uh, if we wanted to change the picture of the tree, like we we're planning on using it in an art project or something, we might want to check this modify adapter build upon box before we pick a platform to search for or to search on. But we will not do those things for the moment. We'll just search. So, Flickr. license, who can tell me what it means? You can't make any profit on it. It's non-commercial research. That's what it is, right? Yeah. And then, um, is that the derivative one where you can like, make it something else? That's right. Uh, so this is <coughs> a uh, Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. And if you click on the some, right reserve, some rights reserved, it will tell you that. Uh, what was I saying? 
suddenly lost track of what I was saying. Uh, so if you were to use this photograph, uh, you would need to give attribution to this author, this uh, Robert Prow Rosnilk, uh, and you would want to include this Creative Commons license, uh, and ideally also the web address, maybe not this one, I think you can share it with the, yes, a much shorter web address. So, when you are providing attribution for a Creative Commons licensed work, remember those three pieces, <coughs> the name of the author, the location of the source, usually web address, uh, and the license itself that you are using it under. I believe, if we go back to my PowerPoint presentation for a moment, let me use some, oh, not this one. Actually, I did not use any Creative Commons, well, I did use the one, but that was a CC0 one, so I just didn't use that. Anyway, at the bottom of your slide, you should provide that attribution. Questions about that? Yes. Is there a certain format that you should follow, like author's name first, then the link, then the license, or should you put like both? Like, is there like any certain like specific way of citing a Creative Commons license? Or not? So citing is a separate issue. Citing is something that we do for academic integrity, mm -hmm. and you would usually do it in MLA or APA format. Uh, attribution is something that we do for copyright. So we're still telling people where it came from. Uh, but we're doing it for legal purposes as opposed to moral purposes. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So no, in answer to your question, uh, there is not, to my knowledge, a specific order that you're supposed to put them in. As long as you have those three things, uh, you're fine. If I were to cite this, I would probably, or not cite it, if I were to attribute this, 